Okay, so um, the, uh, in the final part of the previous lectures, we uh, introduced the uh, super string by using super field formalism, and we brought an explicit expression for the stress tensor uh, of the matter field, which now is composed by the x and the psi's, and for the super Gauss sector, which now is composed by the familiar system, the BC system that we have also in the bosonic string, and the new partner, beta gamma. Right? And I just brought those formula uh, just to stress that it's, uh, uh, the analysis is very similar to the one you have done for the bosonic theory. It's just everything is super symmetric. So you can write the standard, uh, super, uh, the standard BRST current as the ghost times the stress tensor. And now the ghost C is the super field. And the stress tensor is, I try to make the letter capitals, is the super stress tensor, right? Uh, so it's the super field itself. And there is the matter part plus one half the ghost part, right? And what is uh, done there is just the, again, uh, expansion of the super field components. And if my conventions are consistent, this is what you should get if you take uh, the superfield C, the T matter and D ghost, uh, and spanned in terms of the Grassmann variables, the Greek zeta, and then you uh, integrate, so it means you select the component proportional to zeta. And that should be the BRST charge. Right? So you see that the BRST charge contains, uh, is, I just wrote it uh, there in three bits, and these three bits uh, are uh, with increasing powers of gamma, right? The new uh, super Gauss, so that's just a way of writing. And there is a familiar part, which is CTX plus the uh, DCB, right? The Gauss. And then there are the contribution of the new bits. And the idea is to define the physical state, again, as the BRST invariant. Uh, uh, states, right? So you, wa you want, uh, you can do the calculation in a very similar way. If you have a state, you write the vertex operator corresponding to the state, and then you can do the OP. That's the easiest way to do the calculation. And you want to check that the simple pole cancels. If the simple pole cancels, okay, that means that that vertex, that state is annihilated by the BRST charge, and so it has a chance to be uh, a, a physical state, right? It's BRST closed and then, like, it's very similar, right? It's, it sounds, uh, it's just more baroque because you have more fields. So one thing I want to stress is that once you are doing that calculation, you use the OPE that I uh, wrote at the end of the previous lecture, right? So I gave to you the OPE in the super field formalism, and from those you can take the OPE of the elementary fields, so not just the OPE of B and C that you already know, or DX, DX that you already know, but the OPE between Psi, uh, Psi, and the OPE between beta and gamma, right? You can rederive those OPE exactly as we did for the bosonic case from an operator point of view by taking the elementary field, expanding the elementary field in modes, and imposing canonical commutation relation between the modes, right? The two things are equivalent. So let me briefly uh, uh, write these equations because they uh, make manifest one point about periodicities uh, um, of the fields that will uh, be important today. So in particular, the new fields we are adding, uh, the psi, the beta, and the gamma, I'm focusing on this new sector coming in the superstring theory, have all half integer conformal weight, right? The psi's have conformal weight one half, the gamma minus one half, and beta three half. So when we write an expansion in mode, right, we would write something like that for the psi's, 
And here is the standard minus h, right? Minus the conformal weight. And of course, for the psi tilde, right, the antilomorphic sector, everything goes through again. You have the antilomorphic BRST charge, antilomorphic fields, and so on and so forth. Right? And then you have similar expression for beta and gamma, right? Beta is beta r, zeta minus r minus 3 over 2, and gamma sum of r, gamma r, zeta minus r plus 1 over 2. Right? So this half integer shift. Uh, comes from the Jacobian when you move from the cylinder coordinate tau sigma or the complexified version w to the uh, uh, complex plane coordinate right through the exponential map so if you impose this uh, um, this sum over r to be on the integer uh, number then you would impose periodic boundary condition in the cylinder coordinate, but you would have a cut, a, a square root uh, branch cut, in the z coordinate, right? Because if r is integer, then this guy is half integer, this guy is half integer, this guy is half integer. Vice versa, if you write here a sum over the half integers, minus one half, plus one half, three one half, then this, this exponent is always integer, so you would have no cuts in the uh, z plane. Then you would have psi z, psi mu e to the 2 pi i z equal to psi m z if r is a integer. Right. So and with fermions, it's not a surprise that we have this choice, right? Fermions, you can go around, come back, up to a sign. So these are, these we are and will play a, an important role later today, two sectors of people call Neveswart's sector and Ramon's sector. So the one I have been focusing on so far is the Neveswart sector where this sum is over the half integer. Why I'm focusing on that? Because from the superfield point of view, this is the simplest, because these partners, psi is partner of dx, beta is partner of b, gamma is partner of c, they would have the same expansion as the, uh, the partner, right? So the dx is written in terms of minus i, okay, apart the alpha prime, alpha n, uh, zeta minus n minus 1, right? So this is over the integers, and in the Neveswart sector, this is also over the integers, right? So the superfield behaves as a common periodicity, uh, but for one component for the bosonic component and for the fermionic component. So I am for when I write the OP, since these OP are co uh, uh, common, uh, the, the, super, the super OP that I brought, I am in this sector, and this is the Neveswart sector. Now you see here that uh, this three half, as we mentioned yesterday, you can see it as lambda, a system of weight lambda 1 minus lambda. So very similar to the BC system. Two differences. The lambda now is 3 half instead of 2. And this beta and gamma are commuting variable instead of anti-commuting variable. But many things go through by thinking uh, by generalizing the lambda equal 2 to the lambda equal 3 half, right? So, for instance, the definition of the uh, SL2 invariant vacuum, right, would be very similar to the one that we did for the uh, uh, BC system. Right. 
So this is telling me, so if, if, you, if you go back to your notes, you'll see that this is the, the same, uh, the same uh, equation that we wrote for the BC system, if you write them in terms of lambda, right? And so the only thing you have to do now is to put lambda, lambda equal 3 half. So the, 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 uh, this definition is the analog of what we did for the BC system. And in that case, you remember, we had three modes that play a special role. And they were the modes between 1 minus lambda and lambda. Right? So for lambda equal 2, they were the modes minus 1, 0, and 1. So you can immediately see that in this case, the special bits, the zero mod part of the beta gamma system, will be made out just of two uh, uh, modes, not three, because one minus lambda goes to minus one half, and lambda uh, is three half, right? So you have the only, the only two things are one minus lambda and lambda minus one. So before you had minus one, zero, one, and now you have minus one half and one half. Very good. So in a very similar way, when you want to define a, a non-zero scalar product, you will have to insert a something that has to do with these two zero modes, right? So for the BC system, we had C minus one, C zero, C one. This was one, right? And if you want, you can give a name to this thing. Now, for the beta gamma system, I have to insert something to get that different from zero. Now, let me be slow on one point, and then if you have a uh, further question on this, I'm happy to discuss during the break. So what is the analog of this insertion? So the naive temptation is is, would be to insert some gamma. Right, here we are inserting C, and here we're inserting gamma. Why don't we insert gamma minus one half and gamma one half, right? But that's not the correct thing. And the point, uh, uh, the way of seeing that is that when you insert a Grassmann variable, for Grassmann variable, there is a very nice identity, very nice way of thinking about this insertion as an insertion of delta function. Right. So for a Grassmann variable, the delta function of a Grassmann variable is the same thing as the Grassmann variable itself, right? Because well, what is a delta function? It's something that if you do x dx, that's zero. Right. And so this is an explicit realization of delta function. So it's for, for the generalization to the bosonic case, to the beta gamma case, it is better to think at this insertion as inserting three delta functions. that you can write in this way because the C is a Grassmann variable. So in this form, you have a natural generalization in that form. Now, you see that this object, C1 acting on the vacuum, Basically, it does the same job as d gamma one half acting on the vacuum, and does the job of shifting what are the destruction and the creation operator. Right. So on the vacuum, C1 is a creation operator, but if you act with C1, you get a new state which is annihilated by C1. Right. Because if you include another C1, you get C1 squared, you get zero. And this is the same thing. The vacuum is, you can act with gamma one half on the vacuum. It's annihilated only from three half on. But once you put a delta function, you get a new state that is annihilated by gamma one half. Because if you act with gamma one half, 
because of this identity, you get zero. So both in the bosonic and in the fermionic case, you can see this insertion as changing the definition of what is a creation and what is an annihilation operator. Very good. So let me conclude by uh, um, just writing one example in the spectrum of the superstring theory. And uh, the example will be just taking the simplest state we know in the bosonic theory and write it in terms of superfields. Right? So we can take e to the i k x superfield. And then we know that we'll, we'll need to dress this matter part with the ghost. So let me consider the matter part first. So, okay, if we want to, just because of my definition, uh, this superfield is dimensionless, k is dimension of momentum, so I put a root of alpha prime over 2. And if you expand this in superfields, you will get If I did the calculation correctly, this. Now, the fact that you, you, you get two bits, one that is proportional to the Grassmann variable, one that is not proportional to the Grassmann variable, is not surprising. This is a superfield, so I can expand it, and it will play a role later. We'll, we'll interpret this in a, in a nicer way, uh, maybe in one hour time. Right? So for the time being, you can just say, okay, let me take one of these two components. Right? So the first one is exactly the same object that we used in bosonic theory, e to the i k x. And then you can ask whether that object uh, has an OPE that is uh, vanishing with that supercharge that is written there. Right. So focus on e to the i k x, and you will immediately see that with k with q one there is no uh, there is a simple pole, right? Because d x contracts with this x, and it produces a simple pole, right? And that simple pole is not cancelled by anything else. So that by itself is not Beer's invariant. But maybe it's not surprising because even in the bosonic case, we had to dress that with, super go with ghost. And we had to dress this with a C. And so maybe we have to dress this also with some gamma. And since I just argued that inserting C is like inserting delta function of gamma, the natural thing would be to do that. And now you see that this fixes the problem with the OPE with Q1, because you have a simple pole coming from the OPE of this dx with e to the i k x. This gives a simple pole. But then you have gamma d gamma, which is zero. So you have to tailor expand gamma. And so you get a linear term that cancels the simple pole. So this has the chance of being a BRST invariant vertex for the superstring. And then you can do the calculation with the Q0. The part that comes with x and dcb is exactly as the one before. right? So you would get. Uh, something that is alpha prime over 4 k square of minus 1. And then you have an extra term that comes, there is no contribution from this guy because there are no psi. And there is a contribution that comes from this guy because you have dependence on gamma. That contribution is related to the conformal weight. You can do the calculation, but let me be sketchy. 
So gamma is conformal weight minus one half. Delta gamma is eating up a gamma, so as conformal weight one half. So this guy will give an extra contribution of plus one half. So this is coming from the beta gamma. So again, what we want to say is that this is zero, right? That a simple pole coming from the OPE with the BRST current is zero. And this again gives a condition on the K square. So it's a mass shell condition. And again, we get a tachy. So the beta gamma, they indeed decrease the value of the negative mass square. Instead of being related to minus one, it's related to minus one half, but it's still negative. Why, why I'm not considering this one? You will see that this one is described in the same state as this one in another picture. Uh, but in order to describe what this is, I need, uh, you need to wait one, ho one hour, or something like that. So what I'm saying is that uh, um, these two bits are described in the, the same state. And uh, uh, this is a, I almost did the calculation, not, not, not in all details, but you can see, if you just forget this one, you get a BRST invariant state. Right? So it's something that is, is kosher. Right. You can get a BRST invariant state also from this one, and then you, you will say, okay, why two of them? Then in one hour time you'll, you'll see better, I hope. More questions? So the message is that it seems that introducing the technology of the, um, uh, of the superstring didn't help us that much. Right? Because, okay, it's true that A will lower the critical dimension from 26 to 10, but still is the critical dimension is not 4. And it's true that we change the mass of the tachyon, but it's still a tachyon. And we didn't achieve other things that I advertised at the very beginning, such as obtaining space-time fermions. This state is still a boson. And if you construct other states in the same way, so take the bosonic state, supersymmetrize everything, expand in superfield, take the zero component and multiply it by C delta gamma, you will always find a BRST invariant state. But it's a bosonic state. So the Neve-Schwartz model looks like very similar to the bosonic uh, theory. Okay, any question? So what I want to do now is to uh, um, address these problems. And let me just tell you the general idea and then I, I introduce a couple of technical tools that I need to see, show you how it works. So the general idea is that um, we need to include the other sector I just mentioned. So the sector where all the half integer, uh, the, the, the mm, uh, fields with half integer weight have opposite periodicities. So we need to include that Ramon sector. That Ramon sector will bring in the fermionic, uh, uh, the, the, the states that are space-time fermions. And in how these two sectors are combined, how they are put together, um, goes under the name of GSO projection. So you have to take one sector, another sector, combine them in an appropriate way, and that combination will A, produce space-time fermions, so BRST invariant states that correspond not to uh, vector bosons, but 
to space-time fermions. B, it will take, it will get rid of this state, so you will not have a tachyonic state. And, okay, as a consequence of these two things, it will also produce a theory that is not just supersymmetric on the worksheet, but supersymmetric in space-time as well. And so this makes contact with the theories that I think Dario has been describing for you from the low energy effective point of view. Okay, so this is the idea, but technically, how do we implement it? So there are two uh, kind of awkward points uh, from the conformal field theory point of view in this program. And one is to provide a nice expression for this delta function. Right. So for the time being, uh, they appear as a bit of an awkward object. Um, there is an, if you, if you want to say, say it in another way, it seems there is no nice realization of this delta function for the bosonic field as we had for the fermionic field. Right. For the fermionic field, we could just realize it in terms of multiplied by a free field. For the bosonic field, this looks like a complicated function, right? So, one, realize delta gamma, and two, change periodicities for psi, beta, and gamma. How can I do that in a nice way? Okay, so these are the technical points. So what I want to do now, maybe for half an hour, maybe a bit more, let's see, is to introduce, an, uh, so go back to 2D. So we uh, focus on these two points, focus on the 2D description, and introduce a concept in uh, CFT that uh, allows us to uh, to take care of these two problems at once. And that concept, that idea goes under the name of bosonization. Okay, so I'll present this in the very simple setup that is needed just for us. The idea is more general. And let me motivate it by looking at the OPE of uh, the fields we have in our, in our problem. So we have OPE between B and C. And then, very similar OPE is uh, in the matter sector with this size. So, in order to make, uh, to put all things in kind of very similar way, let me take the 10 psi's I have, this psi as an index mu, m, and there are 10 of them, we are in 10 space-time dimension, and let me break Lorentz invariance by pairing these 10 psi's in five groups of two, and introduce uh, com complex combination of those. So I can take psi 1 plus i psi 2 and call it chi 1 and psi 1 minus i psi 2 and call it chi 1 bar. And then I do the same for psi tilde and chi tilde. Always, always left and right. Let me focus on the left. Then you do the same for 3, 4, 5, 6, right? 7, 8. And then I do psi 0 plus psi 9. Let me call this chi phi. And psi 0 minus psi 9. Chi. So, 
if you want, these are light cone coordinates for the zero. And for all the other are just going in the complex coordinate plane, right? So we are thinking about our 10-dimensional plane, the 10-dimensional space as five planes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then zero, nine. Now, the OPE of these chi's are the same as this one. So you have chi bar Z1, chi Z2, Z1. So the only difference is the conformal weight. This is conformal weight lambda equal to it's 1 minus lambda equal 1. And this is 1 half, 1 half. So we can treat this object on the same footing. If I solve the problem for general lambda, then I can put lambda equal 2, I get this one. And then I can put lambda equal 1 half. I get this one, right? Because if I put lambda equal one half, this will be one half, and this is will be one minus one half. It's also one half. So let me write this way. This is the case lambda equal two, and this is lambda one minus lambda, and this is the case lambda equal one half. Okay, so this is just summarizing. Uh, summarizing things we know. And now let me take um, that operator e to the i k x. And just to make things simple, um, instead of writing a dimensionful x, so something that has the dimension of length, now I'm in a conformal field theory uh, perspective. I just want something dimensionless. Uh, so let me write a boson H with the action dH d bar H. Then the OPE of H Z1, H Z2 is minus log Z1, Z2. So I'm just stripping out a factor of alpha prime over 2 uh, because um, yeah, it's simpler. And then you can calculate the OPE e to the i h z1 e to the minus i h z2. Right. And when you calculate the OP of this object, it's the same calculation that we did when we calculated the three-point function, the four-point function, the, the Veneziano amplitude, right? We, we are using the, um, the same formula. So you can use the same formula, right? And then send zeta 1 goes to zeta 2, and you'll see that this goes like 1 over zeta 1 minus zeta 2, right? So th uh, th this is familiar from yesterday, right? It's just I took away the alpha prime over two. Yeah. A boson. Yeah, is a boson satisfying this action? So you can think about H as uh, root two over alpha prime x. Right. So I'm just, uh, so let me stress here, I'm just taking an abstract CFT, I'm telling you, okay, consider the CFT of one boson. The thing I want to stress is that using the things you know, the CFT of one boson, that's the CFT we have been using to describe bosonic string theory, just many copies, D of them, because we had D direction. If you take the CFT of one boson, and then you calculate the OPE of the tachyon, so this vertex operator, you put one, you get the same OP that you're getting here. Right. Any question on this? So what I'm just doing, I'm taking things you know, 
and just give you an uh, unexpected link, right? I'm just stressing that if you choose a particular value of the number that I had here, before we were thinking about that number as the momentum, so something that can change continuously, I'm saying, okay, consider just one particular case, and then you calculate the OPE. Here there will be corrections, right? The OPE has the same form as the OPE for the fermions. So this maybe suggests that these two theories are not that different. That the, the theory in terms of the fermion can be rewritten in, a in terms of a theory in terms of a boson. A complex fermion looks like one boson. So you can start checking this idea more. Right? So you could say, well, if the two theories are the same, they should have the same central charge, the same anomaly. What is the central charge of a boson? Well, we calculated it's equal one, right? That the OPE between THZ1, THZ2, so this is the stress tensor of this boson. That goes like C over two, Z1 minus Z2 to the fourth, plus dot dot dot, with C equal one. Right. Then, yesterday when we do, were doing the calculation of the uh, critical dimension of the superstring, we calculated also the central charge of each of these psi's. And if you remember, each of these psi's contributed half of the boson. Right. And the chi, you see, each chi contains information about two psi's. So psi is a real fermion, chi is a complex fermion. So in the theory of chi, you have two psi's. So the central charge of uh, chi, of the theory of chi, is that of two psi's, so is one half plus one half, which is again one. So CH is one, and C chi is also one. So this is another thing that you can say, okay, check. The two theory, conformal field theories, are characterized by the central charge. This is a free theory, I can calculate what the central charge is, and the two things are the same. One calculation is done with the stress tensor of H, and the other is done with the stress tensor of chi. Very good. So this is telling us that this theory can be dual just to this case, because the central charge of the BC system was very different. Right. So this is the first example of bosonization, and so let me write the dictionary. So the bosonization is really a duality, it's a simple example of duality. So you have a theory of boson, a theory of fermions, two different set of fundamental degrees of freedom from the 2D CFT point of view. Here the fundamental degrees of freedom is a boson. Here the fundamental degrees of freedom is a fermion. And then there is a dictionary that allows you to translate any calculation, any question in one language, in the, question, in the corresponding question in another language. And since this is a free theory, it's a you can check the duality, you can do the calculation on one side, you can do the calculation on the other side, and you have to see that following the dictionary you get the same. So what this dictionary is, it's telling you that chi is like e to the ih, chi bar is e to the minus ih, right? The stress tensor chi goes in the stress tensor of h. Now, in this OP, it is interesting, I haven't mentioned that, but okay, uh, too much, but let me do it so now. It is interesting also to calculate the first finite term. The first finite term is very easy to calculate, right? Because you go back to the original formula that we used. 
uh, for the calculation of the amplitude. Right? So this was the formula we used when you put these two exponentials together, there is a the, uh, singularity and then a normal ordered uh, sum of the two um, exponent, right? The exponential, the normal order exponential of the sum of the exponent. And now you can expand, Taylor expand this guy. If you put zeta 1 equals zeta 2, the exponent is 0, so you get e to the 0, so you get 1. That's the simple pole. And then the first term in the Taylor expansion, so here you have 1 over zeta 1 minus zeta 2. And then the first term of this uh, Taylor expansion, it cancels the pole, and you get that. And then you will have second derivative, third derivative, higher, uh, higher terms. Now you can do the same OPE with the chi, right? And we already mentioned that this is the, the, the uh, leading term, which matches the leading term. And the second subleading term is just the normal order product of chi bar chi. So you read another entry in the dictionary that is i dh is chi bar chi. Now, let me just stress one thing, that this is a non-trivial statement because each entry of the dictionary is mixing what is elementary and composite from the two-dimensional point of view. Right? So this object is an elementary field from the two-dimensional point of view. It's the thing, is, is just the thing that appears in the Lagrangian of the fermion. Chi bar d chi, things like that. But this guy is a composite field, right? You see, it contains an infinite number of terms with higher and higher powers of h. Right? So this is telling us that an elementary object on one side is going to a composite object on the other side. And this is what makes the pos this possible that a fermion goes into a boson. Okay? This is this is not a boson, this becomes a fermion because it's a composite field of bosons. And here you have the opposite, right? An elementary field in A, in the boson, right? This is exactly the thing that appears in the action, becomes a composite thing in the fermionic language. And then you see that, okay, this is a boson and this is also a boson, right? It's a boson which is a composite thing of two fermions. Now, from the point of view of the bosonic theory, you can take this, and this is a current, right? It's something that has dimension 1, h equal 1. So you can integrate this current, you get a charge. We, in, when we were working with the x, we would call that charge the zero mod of h. We would call that the momentum, right? the alpha zero. This is also current. This is conformal weight one half plus one half one. Right, of course, current goes to current. And this current, well, is the standard current that you know from fermions. It's just counting how many uh, fermions you have in your state, right? It's counting the number of chi bars minus the number of chi, right? The number of electrons minus the number of positrons. So this, in this language, is always integer, right? You can have zero chi, one chi, two chi, right, and things. So if you want to m have a duality, you have also to say that the alpha zero can only take integer values. So the eigenvalue of the alpha zero are integer. So you can make this, uh, rephrase this statement by saying that, uh, 
this has to be a compact boson, right? So a boson where the momentum is quantized. The quantization of this thing tells me that the states I need to consider have momentum 1, 2, 3, minus 1, and that's why this takes integer values, right? This was e to the i momentum type boson, and now you see from here the momentum can take only integer values. Very good. Any questions? Sorry, say it again. No, this on the fermion side is, is automatic, right? You, I mean, you can have your vacuum, and you can have uh, chi minus one half on the vacuum, right? You can have, and this is, okay, one fermion. So the, you, you can take, you can expand these in modes, right? You can take the mode expansion of uh, psi, which maybe is still written li uh, up there, right? You, you, you can calculate what this is in terms of modes, and this is just sum of chi bar minus r chi r, right? Uh, so this is just, this is, uh, just counting the numbers of, of, of these objects. So what I'm saying is that on this side, is, is automatically uh, uh, an integer. And so I'm telling you an extra information on the dual bosonic theory. It's a theory where you need to consider uh, 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 integer values. Very good. So what I want to do is uh, uh, just to state what generalization you need to do of this picture in order to take into account the general case with lambda. Right? So this idea of taking a fermionic system and writing it in terms of a bosonic system works also for the ghost, B and C. So that's the first generalization lambda different from one half. And the second generalization that we will need is how you deal with a linear system, but now made out of bosons. So I want to write another equivalent description of the beta gamma system. So for the time being, we have a description in terms of the chi that we can write in terms of a boson. Then I will, I will give you a description in terms of BC that you can also write in terms of another language, bosons. And then I have these bosons that you will be able to write in another language. So these are all 2D dualities. Why do I want to do that? Because when I write this in, the, in this other language, this will be in particular what we need, it will be we, it will provide an easy way to write this delta, the delta gamma. And we will be able to combine the bosonized description of the chi, so this h, with the other description of the beta gamma in a single uh, framework, which will allow us to introduce the space-time fermion. So this is the, the, the idea. Very good. So let me start from one. The idea from, uh, from one is that when uh, lambda is different from one half, the dual boson has a more complicated action than this one. So let me write as phi the dual boson of the BC system. Right. Now lambda is different from one half. And the claim is that the action that I take for phi in order to have such a duality
So I write it in a bit of a sloppy way. Let me, let me explain. So this is the usual term. So th this is the usual term. And now I add an, a term with an extra parameter, this Q. And the claim is that this Q will be 1 minus 2 lambda. Right. So for lambda equal 1 half, this term is not there. And I go back to the previous case. And this provides the new parameter that corresponds to this parameter, the conformal weight of B in the fermionic system. Now, this is coming back to a point that I didn't discuss. Uh, I just glimpsed over it. And if you kill this phi, if you consider just a term such as this one, this R is the Ricci scalar calculated with the worksheet metric H. So you see, this is a bit sloppy because this bit is already gauge fixed and this bit is not gauge fixed. So this bit I already put H equal the Euclidean metric and this I'm still putting the uh, metric of the worksheet. Right. I do that because if I put naively H equal the Euclidean metric, this bit will go away because the Ricci scalar of the Euclidean metric is zero. So let me go back and put this term before the gauge fixing and, this and then I can calculate the Ricci scalar with H. So if you don't put this phi, so if you just put that, that would be the Einstein-Hilbert term of the 2D gravity. We started with the scalar, which was coupled to gravity, right? And then one could say, okay, why don't I add also a kinetic term for H? But as probably you know, in two dimension, this kinetic term is a total derivative. So this is something that Gauss noticed at the very beginning of differential geometry, right? So in two dimension, this is a, a total derivative. And so it's not a dynamical term, right? There is no propagator, right? You can just integrate this. And what Gauss realized is that if this term is not there, this total derivative evaluates to a number and that number is just, uh, uh, carries just information about the topology of the word sheet. So if you integrate this guy on the sphere, you get minus two. If you get on the torus, the torus is flat, you get zero, right? And in general, you get uh, g minus two, right? something related to the genus. So this bit, if you add that bit in the, in, in the action, you'll get just a number. If you include this phi, of course, this will not be a total derivative anymore, right? Because this guy is a total derivative, but is multiplied by a function, right, of z. So this will be dynamical. So this gives me the possibility of making one comment. So in string theory, one uh, identifies this function when this guy is applied to the string action with the space-time dilaton. Right? You remember that when we discussed the clustering spectrum, the massless sector had graviton, an antisymmetric form, and then there was a scalar, even in the bosonic theory. And that scalar, I told, that's the dilaton. Well, that dilaton is identified with this function, right? You can put here a function of x, right? Here, want a function of x. I'm using the string theory language now, function of x. That function is the dilaton. So if the dilaton is constant, so this function of x is some value, you have a constant dilaton, the integral coming from this part will be just e to the constant dilaton times 
something that depends on the genus. And E to the dilaton, the constant part of the dilaton, is identified with the string coupling. So I will not use that much, but if you, this is a kind of intuitive thing, and I hope it can be helpful if you read these in books, right? So sometimes this extra term is called the linear dilaton CFT, right? So if this is, if this function is constant, you just have a constant dilaton, this term of the action just give uh, some uh, number, right, uh, that is proportional to the constant dilaton and the topology of the worksheet. Then the next simplest thing you can do is instead of taking a function which is just a constant, you take a function which is a linear function. Next simpler. Right? So this fx is just proportional to x. And now the x, we are calling it phi. So sometime this thing is called linear dilaton. Now, okay, let me go back to the CFT problem. Why I am making a big fuss about this term if when I gauge fix it goes to zero? And the answer to this is that it does modify the definition of the stress tensor, right? Because the definition of stress tensor is I first have to take the derivative with respect to h and then set h to, to, the, to the flat, right? So that's why for the BC system we had to work a bit hard to find what h was, right? And this guy, you have to take the variation of h and then fix h to, uh, uh, to the flat matrix and it will give a new contribution to the stress tensor. So let me write what the new stress tensor is, right? So this is one minus two lambda. And the new stress tensor is the standard stress tensor So this is the standard part. This factor of two is just because one over alpha prime, we are taking alpha prime equal two, basically, right? when we are stripping this alpha prime over two terms from everything. And this is the new part. This is the part that comes from here. Right? So this is the part proportional to Q. So let me write this, and then we can make a break. So when you calculate, you take, and, and then it's straightforward, right? You take this guy, you calculate the OPE uh, of T and T, you focus on the quartic term, and that gives you the definition of what the central charge is, right? And uh, you will find that the central charge of this object depends on Q. Central charge C depends on Q. is this one. Sorry. S okay, this is lambda. Sorry. Yeah, it should be this one. So, you see, if you set Q equals zero, you go back to the old result, central charge equal one. Right. Now, you have an extra term. This extra term comes from this bit. And you see that it's natural, right, that when this bit contracts with itself, 
there is uh, a quartic pole, right? Because it's second derivative on one part and second derivative on the other part. And when you put lambda equal two, Q is one minus two lambda is minus three. So this is three minus three minus three is nine times minus three is minus 27 plus one is minus 26. So what I'm saying is that you can make very similar steps you can associate, I, I will not use this very much, but I let me just say in word, uh, you can associate to b e to the phi, to c e to the minus phi, and just have a dictionary which is basically I almost identical to this one. The difference I in the calculation of the central charge and the conformal dimension of in the bosonic part, we are changing the bosonic part by this extra term, all follow from this change in the definition of the stress tensor. And then you can just use the free theory. And what I'm saying is that again, you find an equivalent description in terms of a boson. Okay, so that's a, maybe a good moment to make uh, a break and then we'll start by doing similar thing for the beta gamma and uh, put everything together to get a GSO projection. Let's make it five minutes so we have a longer break in the, in the final second part. Okay. Okay, so let me come finally uh, to the bit I was really interested in, which is this beta gamma sector. And let me stress again that all this is in 2D. We are looking at the 2D theories. I'm just providing equivalent description for this various free conformal field theory. So I had a free conformal field theory for the BC. Now I have a free conformal field theory for the beta gamma. And in a very similar way, I want to write it in terms of new fields. Right? And then I claim that this new description is completely equivalent. There is a dictionary such as this one. And any calculation you can do with the beta gamma language, you can do with the new language and vice versa. So let me straight away write what the dictionary is, and then I comment. So beta corresponds to this thing, and eta corresponds to this thing. So this curly phi, again, is a free boson. So this is a free <coughs> boson. So you see, this bit, e to the minus phi, e to the phi, is similar to this bit. Right. And Eta xi are a BC system. So
are fermions. Ah, oh, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks very much. Right. Okay. So what I'm saying is that I am using the same ingredients that we've been discussing so far. And Uh, now I come to that. So they, they are anti-commuting. So maybe let me say anti-commuting. But uh, as she's pointing out, what does it mean they are, they are like BC? Well, the, what I have to tell you is what the conformal weight are. Right? When people have this jargon, a BC system, they are thinking about anti-commuting objects of weight lambda mi one minus lambda right so it's a family of conformal field theories and you choose lambda and you have a different central charge right so what i have to tell you is what the com what the conformal weight is and i choose lambda equal one so this has conformal weight one h eta one and Xi has conformal weight 1 minus lambda, so as conformal weight 0. Right. And for the free boson, I have to tell you, what is this Q? Right. We just mentioned that, okay, you can generalize uh, the action of the free boson, to have this extra term, this extra term modifies the stress tensor, and the stress tensor modifies the um, um, the uh, uh, all the property of the theory, central charge, uh, conformal weight, right? So what I'm telling, what I'm choosing is Q equal minus two. This is not a strange choice, right? Because you see, what I was saying is, in general, I have one minus two lambda, right? So in the previous case, when lambda was two, I had one minus two times two is four, right? Now, beta gamma are a bit like BC with lambda three half, right? So I have one minus two times three half, one minus three, Q equal minus two. So, and the OPE are the standard ones, right? So the OPE between Xi and Eta is the same as between B and C, right? And, um, and, uh, and so you can apply the standard rules, the standard uh, calculation, right? You can write uh, the stress tensor of beta gamma is uh, the stress tensor of the system psi eta, right? You go back to the general answer that had general lambda, and you put lambda equal one, right? And the stress tensor of the phi uh, field is this one, right? With now Q equal minus two. So let me not enter, okay, I have here some examples, but let me not do these examples uh, of calculating the conformal weight. You can check, right, something non-trivial that you want to check is that this guy has really conformal weight equal three half, right? So what you have to do, okay, uh, well, we know the conformal weight of this one, this is conformal weight one. So now you have to calculate the conformal weight of this. So you have to take the stress tensor, do the OPE with this one, right? And then you will have something that should sum up to three half. And here the same, right? This has conformal weight one, so you have to calculate the conformal weight of this one. So the, the calculation I'm, I'm telling you are just uh, 
uh, other examples of things we did, right? And they are all done uh, by using the, the OPE of the free theory, using the stress tensor of the appropriated language, right? So for beta gamma, the beta gamma case, for xi eta, the, the one with the, the, the standard one for the busy system with lambda equal one, and for the boson, this one with Q equal minus two. Right. Very good. Now, let me conclude by saying two things. The first thing is that, uh, I will not use this very much, but you might see this in books. If you take Xi and you do a mod expansion, you would do this, right? Because Xi has conformal weight zero, right? So you don't, you don't change anything here. So there is a term which has a Xi zero, which is a, a constant. That term, you see, never appears because the only thing never appears in the beta gamma language. The only thing that appears in the beta gamma language is the derivative of Xi. So the constant term drops. So if you think in uh, an operator language, the Hilbert space that you write by using the standard Fock construction, right, all the creation operator, blah, 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 of this language, Xi, Eta, and Carly Phi, is bigger than the Hilbert space generated by the mods beta gamma. It's bigger because there is an extra creation uh, operator, right? The Xi zero, Eta zero pair, right? The Xi zero is not present here. So that's why sometimes people call big Hilbert space and small Hilbert space. The physical states need to be written in terms of beta gamma, right? Because that's the original thing we had. We want to write states in terms of beta gamma. And so, if you write uh, those states in terms of the new language, eta, xi, and xi, you will have to avoid using xi zero. Xi zero should not be present. That's the first comment. The second comment is that I was after this boson here, and this language gives a nice way of writing this delta gamma. And the claim, and we will see this in some example, is that the delta gamma that appears there is just e to the minus phi. So claim is that when I take that vertex and I write it in the bosonized language, so I decide to use uh, I decide to use uh, the language of xi, eta, and this Carly phi to describe the super ghost sector. This guy appears as. This is not surprising because delta gamma is like the opposite of, the, of this guy. Right, so it is at e to the phi, okay, delta gamma is e to the minus phi. Right. Now, one way of seeing that, uh, yeah, okay, let me stop here. Okay, are, are, are you okay with this? This bit? Yeah, okay. Um, I was trying to. So, uh, let me motivate in 
motivate this in two ways, right? So first thing is that, okay, there th this delta gamma should have some exponential of phi, right? Because gamma was exponent had exponential of phi, right? Then gamma as dimension minus one half, right? And eta as dimension one. So each phi must have dimension so yeah, I'm doing this correctly. Right. This has, has to have dimension minus three half. Right. So in general e to the i phi as, dim as the conformal dimension h equal a a plus q over 2. So this is the result of taking this stress tensor now with Carly phi q equal minus 2 doing the OPE exactly as we did for, for the tachyon mass, right? but with this new stress tensor and looking at the double pole. You should get this. So let's check whether it's true. If I put uh, So they're missing something. Okay, let, let me recheck thing because I think I have a wrong sign here in my notes. Right, so this probably, I probably have a wrong sign. So, okay, l let me recheck and then we can, the, let me say what, what should happen. Uh, that this guy has the conformal weight that compensates for this and, and gives ga gamma minus one half. We calculate it from a formula like this one. Uh, Probably here I have a minus. Oh, uh, probably a minus here. And uh, um, so if I have a minus here indeed, right, this would be minus two, minus one, minus, minus two, minus one is minus three, three half. Yeah. So this this is probably the result you should get. Right? When you have a equal 1, which is this case, you will have minus 3 over 2, minus 3 over 2 plus 1 is minus 1 half. Now, if you put as I do here e to the minus phi, then you would have a equal minus 1 you would have minus one, then minus a would be one, minus two, divided by two, 
And this minus 2 plus 1 is minus 1, so this would be 1 half. So you see that this guy has kind of the opposite behavior of gamma as the power, and as the right dimension, we said this delta gamma is one half, and this is dimension one half. So that's usually the way, it's the same kind of motivation that we used for this dictionary, right? We check that they have the same OPE, we check that they have the same conformal weight, right? So that, that's, that's, uh, that's how you motivate for that. So this tells you that when you write in terms of the bosonized language, this gamma becomes a familiar composite field, right? e to the minus phi, which looks like, uh, the co the, the looks like similar to this. Right? That's why it's convenient. I, I um, don't have a better explanation than saying that, okay, if you add here eta, you, you'll spoil the conformal weight, right? And you, what, what would you do, like add one over eta because you want to do the opposite of that, fermions, fermions don't want to have the denominator. Yeah, the fermions, yeah. Yes. Yes. Only on on uh, on the state so only on the state where you don't have xi zero. So if you want it's bigger because you have double, right? You can have all the states and then you can dress with xi zero and that's not changing the conformal weight because xi is conformal weight zero, you have another copy of the states. So focus on, on the one without side zero. More questions? Please. Yeah. No. Uh, let, let's, so you have to interpret gamma delta gamma. You have to interpret in OP way, right? So let's see like gamma z1 delta gamma z2 so this is what you get when you do the uh, i w was very very sketchy right, when you take this q1 right and you do the op with this guy right you remember so what i was saying is that you get a simple pole so this this is evaluated in z1 this is evaluated in z2 i do this, the op you get a simple pole when dx is contracted with this, right? And then you would say, okay, let's, let me send z1 to z2. If you do that, this will become gamma z2, and it will be zero because this is delta gamma in z2. So you expand in Taylor series, and you get a linear term. So here, you will get something that's proportional to z1 minus z2 delta gamma, times derivative of gamma times delta gamma. Right. You, you expand this in, ser in, in, in Taylor series, you get that. Right. So this is the same thing, I mean, in, in, this, in the distribution sense, this is the same thing as gamma minus gamma delta prime of gamma. Right. That's not zero. Right? Well, just one second. What I'm saying is that you see, when you do this guy, you have a linear term. Now, if you do the same thing with this guy, right? So you, now you want to do this in the other language. You have e to the phi, e to the minus phi, eta, z1, z2. Right? And then you have a contraction between these two guys. And this guy becomes like z1 minus z2 to minus this product, which is minus 1, so plus 1. So you, you use 
this this uh, uh, this op. Right. So it is the contraction of these two objects that gives you this term, and then you are left with uh, eta, right? And so basically, eta is gamma d prime gamma. So you can, what I'm saying is that the same calculation that I did here, you can do here. You just go to the finite terms of the OP and you read what the dictionary is. The important thing is that they have the same power of Z1 minus Z2. So you can match term by term in the OP. Is this clear? More questions? OK. So let me erase. Um, this and so I can uh, now introduce the idea of GSO and the Ramon sector so in order to do so it is convenient to write the psi and the beta gamma system, right? This half conformal weight sector in the new language. So we have the linear combination that, uh, uh, okay, this is the, the bit I raised, the chi. So we have five pairs of this guy, and these five pairs. Each one had a boson. And this boson had Q equals zero. So we have five. So A is zero, or oh, was one, two, three, four, five for us. So these five bosons correspond to psi. And then I have an extra boson phi. The, which comes from the beta gamma system. And this had Q equal minus two. And then I have the eta and psi. Now, the suggestion is Think about these six bosons as a family. And the vertices, the BRST invariant vertices that we construct, such as the case up there, they will look like things where you have E to the I H I H I plus H six Phi. So what I'm saying here is that you can characterize the sectors of the psi and the beta gamma in terms of this new language, this dual language, by uh, vectors of uh, numbers that are this age. So, age one, age five, age six. So the example of the tachyon is just 0, 0 minus 1. Now, if you take 
the same approach that I was discussing here. And instead of starting from the taking, you start from the vector. You will start from dx e to the i k x over 2. Then you expand in superfield. You take the zero component. You will get something which is psi m e to the i k x. And then we dress it with c and delta gamma, which is e to the minus phi. So this is just another example where I follow the same recipe. I write the result of the first excited level of the vertex operator that we had in bosonic string theory. Write everything in terms of superfield. So this becomes a superfield, this becomes a superfield, this becomes a superderivative. And then expand. And then take the terms independent of zeta and dress it with this C and delta gamma. Exactly as it happened for this one, this will be BRST invariant working out this BRST. And I just want to stress that in this new language, you see this psi m is just e to the i h, right? You remember the dictionary, the boson, which, okay, I canceled the wrong uh, uh, blackboard, but the dictionary was that chi is e to the i h, chi bar e to the minus i h, right? So depending on what psi m is, if it's psi 0, psi 1, psi 2, right? You will have one of these h's to be one, right? This is psi plus psi, right? So, sorry, is this clear, right? So what I'm saying is that uh, I'm taking uh, the answer in terms of the original fields, the psi. I want to translate it in terms of these new fields. And every time I see one psi, that corresponds to one factor like that. Right. It can be either e to the plus i h or e to the minus i h. So for the vector, for the first excited level, the massless state, this object appearing here will be of the form like this, 1, 0, 0, 0, minus 1. Plus or minus here. Right? Or 0, plus, minus, 0, 0, minus 1. It will be some combination of objects like that. So the fact that here you have, in the first five entries, you have one of them which is 1, is telling you that in your state there is one psi. So, the thing I want to motivate is that the states are defined by a lattice, right? These vectors takes integer values, right? And the point of this six-dimensional lattice correspond to states. So, okay, you, you have the Psi sector and the Super Ghost sector. The Super Ghost is the same as before, right? So the final entry here, the final entry here, which is H6, is telling me how the Super Ghost behave, right? So H6 is minus one here and is minus one here because in both cases I had e to the minus phi and e to the minus phi. 
Now, in this case, I didn't have any Psi. And what I'm just writing here in a sketchy form is that Psi's are like com linear combination of Chi, and Chi are things like that. And since there is none of these, all this must be zero, right? All these objects are zero. So they have e to the zero is one. The only contribution is coming from here. Now, in the other case, I have just one single Psi. Suppose it's, it is uh, Psi 1, right? If it is Psi 1, it will be a linear combination of chi and chi bar. So it will be a linear combination of these two, right? I will have this guy plus or minus i, another guy, and the first one will have with plus one, and the other one will be minus one. So what I'm saying is that all possible uh, stay operator of that form will be linear combinations of uh, points in the lattice, the term of this type. It is a very important point, so if it's not clear, just stop me. Okay, so what I can do now is uh, to uh, state what the DSO projection is. And then we will see why it works, right? So this is something I mentioned I in the bosonic theory. So what we are trying now to do is exactly that. We are trying to kill this state. We try to kill this state, right? And this goes under GSO project, in the name of GSO projection. And the natural way of, the natural thing would be, okay, you have your lattice, and we keep only half of the point of the lattice. And in particular, we keep the point where the sum of all hi is even. So you just sum all these numbers, right? And these are integers, so it can be even e either odd or even. And if it's odd, you will say, okay, I throw it away. If it's even, then you keep it. Right. So it, with this form, you will kill this one and you keep this one. But this is uh, uh, a definition that holds for any states, right? What I'm saying is that in this language, any state is a point in the lattice, right? So massive string states will have uh, uh, things that are uh, bigger than uh, than one in general, right? So you can have uh, 13, 12, and will be uh, 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 one. It can be used to generate one state, right? And then you do this sum, and if it's odd, you say, okay, that's projected away. Now. Why does this work while in the bosonic case it didn't? So you have to do the same calculation that we did in bosonic case, right? So we want to see whether if we take two states that are GSO even, so the GSO projection keeps them, and then you calculate a three-point function with a third state, which is, which is GSO odd, we want to check whether that three-point function is zero or not. So. What you want to do, for instance, is doing something. Now you have h of the state one, h of the state two, right? And let me call a. Let me call this h total, right? This is h total, right? So you have you have a state which is defined by um, a point in this lattice. You have another state, and you have a third state. And so you want to show that it is not possible to have even, even odd. Right? This one is determined by H1i, is determined by 16, you sum this 16, and that's going to be the total H for that state. Right? And you want to keep only the even, so 
this particular uh, configuration, even, even odd, should not appear, right? Because if it does, then this projection uh, will work for external states, but the states that you killed in the external states will again appear as internal states. This is what the, was happening in the bosonic case. I, is this clear? Yeah, no. It's just, it's just nicer in the bosonization language because it looks like things we know and so it's easier to do calculation. Yeah. The second point was to say that we haven't arrived that yet. Okay. Yeah, it's still to come. So I'm still, I'm still focusing only on the Neveshwar sector. So I haven't discussed anything about periodicity changing operator. Right? I haven't done that yet. And I'm focusing on the Neveshwar sector, giving you a new language to define the Neveshwar states. And I'm telling you that I will keep only half of those. Of yes, yes, you can do that. Uh, it's, uh, it, it will, uh, you can define bef uh, in the, in the uh, previous languages, just that this definition will automatically carry over in the Ramon sector, right? Th that's why I'm, uh, I I'm doing this, right? Because in the Ramon sector, yeah, th this will be natural. So once you, once you are happy with this definition, it, it will just carry over. I just have to choose the right action that describes the, the corresponding system, right? It's a duality, right? So I'm really telling you, okay, this is the right, this is a new language, and I have to make it precise so that it's really dual to the, the theory I want. Yeah, that fixes all the parameter Q, right? So for, for the beta gamma, this Q has to be minus two, right? Uh, because the central charge depends uh, on, uh, it was maybe still written here, uh, right? So you, you, you want to have the theory with the same central charge and it will only happen if this Q is minus two. No, but as he was saying, uh, the projection you do it in in both languages, right? So you, you have your your uh, system written in terms of psi, beta, gamma. You write all the states. You have your system write written in terms of h and this curly phi. The two the two systems are equivalent, so you can write the same set of states. So you have a long list of states written in psi, beta, gamma. A long list of states written in terms of h. Uh, and Carly Phi, and we kill the same states, right? So we kill the tachyon in both, in both sides. We keep the masses vector in both sides. No, this, I, I, I'm not fully understanding your question. I mean, the, the operators that ma map is a one-to-one -one thing, right, in CFT. Always, always, yes. Sir. The, 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 so you have a CFT, you can write an operator, and the state corresponding to the operator, this has nothing to do with the bosonization, right? Any CFT, abstract CFT, you write a local operator, you send z equals zero, you get a state. There is just, and you get only one. And it's true, I, I didn't show it, but I tell you, it's true also the other way around. If you have a state, you can just write one, one operator. Right. So you have one CFT with all the, your states and the other CFT with all the states. And what I'm telling you, you have a dictionary so you can map this state goes to this one, this state goes to that one. And I'm killing in both sectors 
the same state, like the document, keep the vector. And as it was saying, okay, why did, it, why did you wait so, so long to define that I want to kill the document? I could have told you right away. Well, uh, because this definition, uh, 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 will, uh, this definition will carry over right in the Ramon sector, and I can now show you the, this point. So more questions? So I, I will end with this, with this. It just not take me like three minutes. So. But I want that this point is clear, because otherwise... Uh, uh, that then I do the spectrum of the super string and the Polchinski calculation, and it will be mysterious. <laughs> okay. Um, so, um, okay. Let me stress again, a crucial point, right? So we want to see whether the states we killed surreptitiously appear again as uh, poles in amplitude, right? So you can have an amplitude with massless vector, massless vector, massless vector, massless vector. I'm thinking about open strings, right? So even, 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 even. I'm asking whether something that is like a tachyon or any other state I want to kill, so something where this sum is odd, if that can appear. And it can appear if and only if this three point on shell amplitude is different from zero. So is it possible to have something which is allowed, something which is allowed, which is something that is GSO odd, have this three point amplitude? In bosonic theory, we checked that, and that amplitude was different from zero, right? We had vector, vector and tachyon. I gave you an explicit expression, right? You can easily calculate it was different from zero. So the question is, what is now different? Right. Okay. Conceptually, what you have to do is the same thing. So you have to take a vertex operator corresponding to the even state number one, the vertex operator corresponding to the even state number two, and the vertex operator corresponding to the odd state number three. And you want to see whether this is different from zero. Now, the ho all the interesting fun happens in the psi and beta gamma system, right? The calculation for the x and the bc will be exactly as before. But let me remind that in the calculation of the bc, it's important that this vertex operator, each one contains a, a c. Right? Because you want c minus 1, c0, c1. Now, this was the analog statement of... Uh, uh, the beta gamma. So this amplitude here will be different from zero or if and only if you have uh, the insertion of these two gamma to delta. Sorry. And in the bosonized language, this insertion is very easy to state and it's just telling us that the sum of this H6 H6 for the first particle, H6 for the second particle, H6 for the third particle, has to be minus 2, right? Minus 1 was 1 delta, minus 2 is 2 delta. So it, this is different from 0 only if H6 1 plus H6 2 plus H6 3 is minus 2. H6 is telling me this bit, right? And this phi is related to the beta gamma system. So this is the equivalent statement here. And this amplitude is different from zero if and only if all the other H from one to five Right? Sum to zero. Right? This is not a strange statement. This statement, if you think that this vertex, vertex operator is like the tachyon, is e to the i the boson, this statement is just momentum conservation. Right? 
like in the three-point function we calculated, the four-point function we calculated, right? We always got from the zero mod part of this boson a constraint that was telling us that the momenta should sum to zero. These objects are normal bosons, and so everything should, there is, there is no, there is no Q term. This term isn't there. So everything works exactly as for the boson representing the string coordinates, the x, and so you have this. Are you happy with that? Very good. Okay, so what we can do now, right, is sum, right, sum this identity to get the h total. So this is the h of, there are uh, six of them, a equal one, two, three, five, and six. These are the h defining the uh, first state. These are the h defining the second state. These are the h defining the third state. So if I sum this three thing, right, this, this thing, this guy and this guy, I sum, I get h1 total plus h2 total plus h3 total equal minus 2. Right? Just, just an algebraic constraint that comes from, from this constraint. And now you see that if h1 total is even, h2 total is even, then h3 total has to be even. Just bring this on the other side, and you see that h3 total is a sum of even numbers. So this interaction is zero. So this proves that in the Nevesworth sector of the superstring, you can implement in a consistent way this truncation. And once you get rid of the tachyon from the external particle, it will never be generated in three-level amplitude, and so you are defining a consistent spectrum where the tachyon is absent. Okay, any question? We will do one loop uh, before the end of the course. This Polchinski calculation is an example of the one loop. And you will see how we get rid of the tachyon there. We will have to implement the GSO, yeah. But that's a good point. Okay, then see you in half an hour. <laughs>